using stuff very rapidly since he got here. Um, he's very good at getting very awesome high-tech pieces of technology to look at what he's looking at. He's got this um, 3D scanner that just goes around. It seems to be like 24-7 in the lab, it's just scanning skulls and doing all this really awesome and stuff. And in our apartment too. And in the apartment too. <laughs> See, so he's, uh, he's definitely dedicated to these little furry guys. So um, he's doing some really fascinating stuff. I mean, after sea otters have been such a big part of kind of the Central Coast's natural history, um, you'd think that there wouldn't be much left to do, but he's finding all these cool avenues to look at these creatures that have never been looked at before. So, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Cool, thank you for the intro. So this thing doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, I'm a third year, starting my third year in a PhD program in Dr. Rita Maida's lab at UC Santa Cruz, and I study sea otters. So, I guess I'll go back. Hey, so I'll go a little intro of my research interest. So ever since I was a little kid, I was fascinated by the great diversity in animal form and function across the tree of life, and how these different features allow different animals to survive in their respective habitats. So as a grad student now, I really take components of various pieces of animal characteristics to understand how they survive in different environments. So first I look at animal ecology, which is how animals interact with the environment. Second is animal morphology, which is just the structure of how the animal looks. And third is the ability, which is how an animal uses their morphology to interact with the environment. And fourth is behavior, so whether an animal chooses to use its abilities to do its thing. And then how all of these four factors contribute to the survivorship or fitness of individual species. So as a grad student, or throughout my, or for the past couple of years, I've had the opportunity to study various animals around the, kind of around the world. So in Australia, I've looked at soldier crabs. In San Diego, I looked at polychaete worms. And in Catalina, I looked at, or studied some more eel biting. But now in Monterey Bay, I'm looking at sea otters. So, the library closing in 20 minutes at 7 o'clock. If you're working on the terminal, plan to finish at about 10 minutes before closing at 6.50, particularly if you are printing or saving to some kind of solution. Good to know. Yeah. We are closing in 20 minutes at 7 o'clock. You, you needed a break. Okay. <laughs> it takes a long time to get this talk. And there is a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> just keeps going. Oh, really yeah. in the up there meeting room. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, now I'm studying sea otters in Monterey, Monterey Bay. So, I've been talking about sea otters for the rest of my talk. So, specifically, I'm going to talk about dietary specialization in individual otters and how this relates to variation in skull morphology biting ability and tool use of behavior and how all of these relates to the survivorship of individual otters. <laughs> so just a little background before we go into sea otters. So dietary specialization is fairly common in the tree of life. So there are different morphologies across different species that are linked to these different diets. So classic example of this are Darwin's finches where you have big beaked birds that specialize on big beak or big seeds and small beaked birds that special, specialize on small seeds. However, what if you were to look within a single species, such as the cocos finch? Within a single population, individuals specialize on different diets. So you have some individuals that specialize on grubs, others that specialize on um, nectar, and others that specialize on seeds. So this leads to the question of why does a group of um, individuals within the same species specialize on different diets? So from a functional perspective, you can look at the variation in their ability to exploit particular prey and how this is linked to individual dietary specialization. In many terrestrial vertebrates, biting is the primary mechanism to capture and consume prey. So you can imagine that having the ability to bite is very important for the survival of these species. To measure bite inability, we use a tech where we use bite force, which is a widely used measurement of bite inability and has drawn many relationships between skull morphologies 
and dietary specializations across species. However, few studies have looked at the variation in bioavailability within a single species, as well as its relationship with the evolution of novel behaviors used in feeding. And of course, one of these novel behaviors is the use of tools to open previously inaccessible sources of food. So examples of tool-using animals include ravens that use sticks to um, gain access to grubs, chimps that use rocks to break open seeds and, and nuts, and some populations of dolphins that use sponges to protect their nose as they look for benthic prey. In California, of course, we have the sea otter, which uses rocks to break uses rocks as anvils or hammers to break open hard shell prey items like the sea urchin. So sea otters are a perfect opportunity to study the relationship between biting ability and tool use, and look to see whether these differences in feeding um, strategies affects the energetic income of individual otters. So sea otters live in a cold environment. Unlike marine ma other marine mammals, they don't have blubber, so instead they are reliant on their extremely high metabolic rate in order to generate their own heat to stay warm. So as a result, they eat a lot. And they spend 20 to 50% of their entire day eating. And they must eat up to 25% of their body mass just to stay warm. So that's like an average human eating 50 hamburgers a day. Wow. So in Monterey Bay, the southern sea otter consumes a variety of hard shell prey items, including mollusks like abalone, snails, clams, and mussels, echinoderms like urchins and sea stars, and other invertebrates like crabs. What you notice is, is that the majority of these prey are hard shell invertebrates. So you can imagine that otters would need to generate a really high bite force in order to break them open. So for the past few decades, researchers have been observing wild otters in order to better understand their ecology. Researchers identify individual otters based on flipper tags, and they can identify the individuals and record important ecological information such as their habitat movement, their reproductive status, and their foraging habit, habits, like what it's eating, how big the prey item is, and whether it's using tools or not. One of the greatest discoveries that these observational studies have found was that sea otters exhibit individual dietary specialization. So what this means is that individuals specialize on particular prey. So some individuals specialize on crabs, others specialize on clams, and others specialize on snails. Furthermore, they also found that there is great variation in tool use to feed. So some individuals use rocks to break open hard shell prey items, whereas other individuals don't use rocks at all, yet still feed on the same prey. Even more recently, however, um, this individual dietary specialization is now believed to be primarily driven by the females that live in smaller habitat ranges. In contrast, males are now seen as less specialized and feed on a more, or feed on a more variety of prey items. And this may be due to their greater habitat ranges. So there is clearly variation in diet, both between and within the sexes. So my research is to understand whether this variation in diet, in diets translates to the variation in skull morphology, biting ability, and tool use behavior, and how these three components affects the survivorship of individual otters. So I have three main research goals. The first is to determine age-related patterns of sexual dimorphism in the skull and biting ability. Second is to examine the hardness of different prey species and its effects on the relationship between biting ability and tool use frequency. And third, to determine the relationship between tool use frequency and energetic income of individual otters. So for today, I'm just going to really focus on the first goal, and that is to describe the age-related patterns of sexual dimorphism in a skull and biting ability. So sexual dimorphism is simply the divergence of phenotypic traits between the sexes. So this is fairly common in the tree of life, and examples of these include the feathers in birds, the fins in fish, and I don't know what you call that in lizards, um, horns in the males of beetles and deer, and differences in body sizes in animals like lions. In marine mammals, sexual size dimorphism is a fairly common trait in cetaceans, which are whales and dolphins, and pinnipeds, sea lions, and seals. So examples of 
um, marine mammals that exist, sexual size dimorphism include killer whales, river dolphins, sea lions, and the elephant seal. Yeah. Yes. Like many of those uh, marine mammals, sea otters also exhibit sexual size dimorphism, where males are up to 46% larger in body mass. So there are two mechanisms for how sexual dimorphism arises in a lot of animals. First is, is sexual selection, which states that sexual dimorphic traits evolved as a result of competition within the sexes. So these traits give certain individuals greater advantages in reproducing or attracting the other sex. So a classic example of this is up north in Año Nuevo, the elephant seal, where male elephant seals can get up to eight times bigger than female elephant seals. So during the breeding season, male, you can occasionally see males fighting with each other for control of the harem of breeding females. The most dominating male is usually the largest, and he's able to control the harem, breed with all the females, and pass down his genes that select for larger body sizes. Alternatively, sexual dimorphic traits can also evolve through the intersexual niche divergence hypothesis which states that sexual dimorphic traits evolved as a result of resource partitioning. So males and females utilize different resources within the same habitat and reduce the competition between males and females. So an example of this is the green wood. Yeah, library is not closing in 10 minutes at 7 o'clock. <laughs> if you were going to keep more attention, please plan to finish your meeting in the next couple minutes to just to check out. Or you can take fine or whatever, please go to the service desk at the moment. We're closing in 10 minutes at 7 o'clock. Yeah, I kind of messed it up. That's why it looks like that. That was a shorter one. I don't know. Uh, what was I saying? Something. Green wood hoopie. Green, green wood hoopie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so the divergence in beak morphologies allow males and females to utilize different resources. So. Females with their smaller beaks can specialize on smaller prey like spiders and bugs, whereas males with their larger beaks specialize on centipedes, caterpillars, and roaches that are up to 175% larger than female prey. So this is clear evidence of dietary partitioning. So these two mechanisms serve as possible hypotheses for why sexual dimorphism occurs in sea otters. But I'm just going to focus on the second one, an intersexual niche divergence hypothesis. So I already showed you that sea otters exhibit variation in the degree of sex or a degree of dietary specialization between males and females. So this is evidence of resource partitioning. So now the question is, does this translate to differences in the, in the morphology and functional ability of the sea otter's skull? So I have three main questions. The first is, are there sexual dimorphism, or is there sexual dimorphism in the CR skull? Do males and females differ in their bite forces? And are there differences in skull growth between males and females? So the first question is really looking to see, or looking at differences between um, skull size and skull shape between males and females. So to do that, I measured 22 cranial dental traits in 19 adult female skulls and 23 adult male skulls. So some of these measurements include like the total skull length, the width of the skull, the height of the skull, and a few other measurements. Then I tested to see if size and shape were significantly different from each other in males and females, or significantly different between males and females. So let's look at the results. So first sexual size dimorphism. So I mean, just based on looking at a female skull on top and a male skull on the bottom, you can see that males are a little bit larger. So when we did our stats, we found that cranial dental traits were up to 7% larger in males than females. So this is unsurprising given the fact that we even know that male sea otters can get up to 46% larger than females in body size. However, what was surprising was that we found some slight sexual shape dimorphism between males and females. Just looking at these skulls, it would appear that there's not much change or differences in shape. But our staff said that this was driven primarily by six uh, measurements. First is the post over the width, the temporalis in lever, a couple of teeth measurements, and the auditory bola. 
I'm just going to focus on the first two because they are directly related to feeding um, performances. So the first trait is the post orbital width, and it's just the narrowest distance after where the eye socket is, so like right here. Um, so in carnivores, a narrower post orbital width allows for more jaw muscles on the skull, and with more jaw jaw muscles you can generate a greater bite force. Mm -hmm. So in most carnivores, males typically have a narrower post-orbital width, which allows them to generate greater bite forces than females. However, in our study, we actually found the opposite trend, and that females actually have a relatively narrower post-orbital width than males. So this allows us to hypothesize that females can actually generate a relatively stronger bite force than males. The next trait is the temporalis in lever. So this is just the distance from the condyle where the jaw rotates to the top of the coronoid process where jaw muscles attach. So we can think of a temporalis in lever as a wrench. You use a wrench to generate torque in order to rotate objects like nuts and bolts. And to generate the greatest amount of torque, you want to apply your force at the very end of the wrench. So this distance from where you apply your force to that rotating object can be seen as an uh, in lever distance. So a wrench serves as a perfect model for how a jaw works. To generate the greatest amount of torque, you want to have your jaw muscle force as far away from the con or from the condyle as possible. So the longer the, your temporal is in lever, is coming to a close in five minutes. Yes. Hurry up. <laughs> So the longer your temporalis in lever, the greater amount of torque you can produce, and therefore the greater amount of bite force you can generate. So in our study, we found that females have a relatively longer temporalis in lever than males. So this again suggests that females might have a relatively stronger bite. Okay, so back to the original question, is there sexual bite for sexual dimorphism in the sea otter skull? The answer is yes. We found that there's sexual size dimorphism where males are larger, and that there's also sexual shape dimorphism where, where, where some traits suggest that females can generate a relatively higher bite than males. So naturally, the next question to ask is, do males and females differ in their biting ability? So to do that, I estimated bite forces using a biomechanical model based on muscle dissections. Working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, I obtained the sea sea otters through the sea otter necropsy program. So scientists in the California Department of Fish and Wildlife perform these necropsies to determine the cause of death of stranded sea otters. During this time, they simply save the heads for me and I dissect out the jaw muscles. And from those jaw muscle dissections and some skull measurements, I can estimate a maximum bite force based on lever mechanics. So real quickly, we can treat a mammalian jaw like a sea otter as a pretty simple lever system, just because it's of its pretty simplistic movement. So the mammalian jaw just closes up and down without much rotation. So there are two main muscles responsible for closing the jaw. First is the temporalis muscle, which you might be familiar with from earlier, and the masseter muscle, which is your cheek muscle. So these two muscles close the jaw, and from those muscles we can estimate a bite force using this pretty simple equation. So bite force is simply equal to the, the torque produced by the temporalis plus the torque produced by the masseter divided by your out lever, which is just your jaw length. Where you're, where you're, where you, where the CR is biting. So let's look at some results. So here is bite force as a function of body mass. So on an x-axis we have log body mass. On a y-axis we have bite force. Each point here now represents a single individual otter with bite force data. The red circles are females and the blue triangles are males. So when we plot our regression lines in our data, it would appear that females might actually have a relatively higher bite force, and that's because this red line is on top of the blue line. 
However, when we do our stats, we find that these two lines are not significantly different. So this means that the relative fight forces of males and females are, are the same. And, yeah, are the same. <coughs> Uh, so then we can reject the hypothesis that we came up with earlier. However, now let's look at the maximum bite force that a male and female sea otter can generate. So using our model, we found that the maximum bite force of a sea otter is around 644 newtons, whereas the females is a little bit lower at 569 newtons. So just to put that into perspective, an average human can generate a bite force of around 750 newtons. So going back to our male and female sea otters, so there's still 75 or 75 newton difference between males and females. So this suggests that males, because they're larger, can generate larger bite forces and therefore maybe go after harder prey. So just to recap, first, pound for pound, males and sea otters do male and female sea otters do not differ in their bite force. What this means is that male, a male sea otter and a female sea otter of similar body sizes have similar bite forces. <laughs> However, when we look at the maximum bite force produced by a male and female, we found that max or the male can still generate a higher bite force, and this is largely due to the fact that male sea otters, or some individual males, can get up, can get obtain much larger body sizes than any female and even other males. Okay, so we learned that there's sexual dimorphism in skull size, skull shape, and biting ability. Now we can ask the question, is this due to the fact that sea otters maybe have different um, skull growth rates between males and females? So here is a picture of a one-day-old pup skull on the left and a 15-year-old adult skull on the right. Just looking at these two images, you can see that there's great changes in skull, both skull size and skull shape as the pup transitions into an adult. So we can quantify that change using a technique called geometric morphometrics. So to do that, I photographed 200 eight skulls of different age classes. Then I place homologous landmarks on each of these skulls. So a homologous landmark is simply a point on a skull that is found on every single individual. So an example of one of these landmarks that I use is the point here, which is the intersection of where the canine attaches to the skull. So that point is found in the adult, in the pup, and the remaining 206 skulls. So I have I mean, I like 48 landmarks on each skull. Then the, the skulls are scaled to the same size and simply placed on top of each other. And it's the variation in these landmark coordinates that is our shape variable. Okay, so let's look at some results. All right, not yet. So these are, so I, again, I did for 208 skulls across five age classes from pups, immature, sub-adults, adults, and aged adults. Hey, let's look at some of the results now. So these are, so these are the landmarks of the mean pup shape. So on the left, we have females, and on the right, we have males. So you, the image is just simply taken away and all that's left are those landmarks that I placed earlier. So on the next slide, you'll see how these landmarks change positions as the pup transitions into an aged adult. So each of these arrows signify change in skull shape. The longer the arrow, the greater the change. So we can break this down even further by age class. So these, these are all the different age classes, again, females on the left and males on the right. On the top row, we have the transition from pup to immature, then immature to subadult, subadult to adult, and adult to aged adult. Just quickly looking at these figures, we see that the greatest amount of change occurs in the first four years of a sea otter's life. And we can tell by those longer arrows in these four images than those bottom four images. So now the question is, do, these, do males and females differ in their growth rates? 
So we can test this by plotting growth curves. So on the x-axis, we have estimated age from 0 to 15 years. And on the y-axis, we have that shape variable that we came up with. So each point here represents a single individual with, or each point here represents a single individual otter skull, the one of the 208 skulls that I photographed. Circles are females and triangles are males. The colors represent each age class. So you have pups, um, immature subadults, adults, and aged adults. So we can fit our growth curves, which are the red line, which is this top line. The red line is our female growth curve, and the blue line is our male growth curve. When we do some stats, we find that these growth curves are significantly different, meaning that the growth rates of skull shape in male and female otters are different. So males reach mature skull shape at age three years, or 2.3 years, whereas males reach mature skull shape a little bit earlier at just over one year of age. Now let's look at skull size. So again, we had skull shape, now we're gonna look at skull size size, so on the y-axis, it's called sex. Uh, so again, we see a similar pattern. And again, when we do our stats, we find that rates, growth rates of skull size are also different between males and females. So females reach mature skull size at age three, and males reach mature skull size a little bit earlier at age 2.4 years. So we can conclude that males grow faster in their skull size and shape, and reach mature skull size and shape faster than females. And this suggests that sexual dimorphism in both size and shape may have resulted from differences in skull growth rates. So how this is tied to their ecology is still undetermined because I'm still working on that. So I'll have to get back to you guys. So we looked at, we, now we have an underlying, or we have a baseline understanding of the morpho skull morphology and biting ability of sea otters. We learned that males have larger skull sizes and stronger bite forces than females, and that males have faster skull growth rates and reach mature skull size and shape faster than females. So now we can use this information and tie it to the dietary ecologies of wild otters and ask specific questions of like how do these um, morphological and functional traits influence the ability of some otters to specialize on particular prey. Because the majority of hard or the majority of prey items that CRs feed on are hard shelled, we can quantify prey by their hardness. And then we can look to see if or we can look at to see if for relationships between biting ability and tool use and how this affects their how this affects individual income of calories by selecting different diets. Uh, so for the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk about some of the methods that I'm going to use to test these questions. So the majority of my data will come from these observational studies, and these data sets include the body size metrics, prey preferences, and tool use frequency. Then from these same individual otters, I'm going to tame uh, in vivo bite forest data point data from them. So to do that, um, we're going to do that. We're going to record by forces during these sea otter capturing events. So it's a team of scientists from the U.S. Geological Survey, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium uh, occasionally capture wild otters in order to perform health examinations as well as flipper and radio tag them so that they can be studied even more from shore. Otters are captured using Wilson traps and brought on to a boat and apparently while they're in a trap in a boat, they tend to bite everything in front of them. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to stick this bite force meter in front of them and while they're in a trap and they'll bite it and then we'll record their bite force. And the sea otters bite at the very end of the bite force meter where there's leather to protect their teeth. And lastly, I'm going to quantify prey by measuring their prey hardness using a materials testing machine. So what exactly it does, it measures the force, the amount of force it takes to break open or to rupture each prey item. So to do that, or I mean, so I've done that for a couple of species now, and these prey rupture forces range from 360 newtons in purple urchins to over 2,000 newtons in giant rock scallops. So other prey that I've tested so far include mussels, snails, and a couple of species of crabs. 
So now let's compare it to our estimated bite force based on the model. <clears throat> so on the bottom, we have prey hardness with all the different species I've tested so far, ranging from the purple urchin to the giant rock scallops. And on the top, we have the estimated bite force. So a female maximum bite force is around 569 newtons, whereas a male ma the male maximum bite force is around 644 newtons. So just looking at these two graphs, it's clear that there are a couple of species of prey species that require much higher forces to break than any otter can generate just from bite force alone. So this suggests that some individual otters that are reliant on just bite force alone may be limited in the types of prey they can consume. But of course we all know that some sea otters use tool use. So this leads to the question of the, do harder prey contain more calories? And do tool using otters eat these harder prey, which allows them to gain more calories than non tool using otters? So, really, that is the beginning part of this, or just the beginning of this part of my study. I've really focused on the understanding the skull morphology of sea otters and how this is linked to some fighting ability based on a model, but really we need to test it out with the wild otters. So the next goal steps are to record that in vivo bite force data and correlate that with the tool use behavior. And that way we can really understand how these different feeding strategies it, uh, contribute to the variation in dietary specializations that we see in Monterey's otters, as well as under, or maybe figure out whether tool use actually increases the caloric income of individuals. And with that, I'd like to thank a bunch of people, especially from Cali the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, USGS, and, and UCSC, as well as my lab mates and funding. And yeah, I'll take any questions. So not all otters use tools? Not all otters use tools, yeah. Huh. It, yeah, they found that it really depends on what kind of prey that they're eating. Like those special, those snail specialists, especially use tools a lot more than like the guy that eats only um, crabs. Huh. Were you surprised about the narrow shape of the female area as opposed to the male difference? Yeah, because in other studies looking at like river otters, males have that narrower postorbital width, mm -hmm. so they can have more muscles and allow them to have a stronger bite force. But yeah, it's just weird that females have a narrow, relatively narrower one. So building off of that, is how are you reconciling? Like you found the two different things about females are, you would predict just based on the skull morphology that they'd have stronger bite forces. Is there like a difference in like, do you think that's making them closer to males because males have the bigger skulls which would mean bigger bite forces? Like is there some, it's like getting them closer to males than it would otherwise? Right. I. I'm so curious about that. Yeah, I, I don't really understand it as well, just because, I mean, just looking at the raw numbers of my estimate by forces, a lot of the, if you control for size of so a male and female, similar body sizes, the female will have a slightly larger bite force relative mm -hmm. to the male, but just, just overall ontogeny, that trend isn't significantly different enough. So whether maybe if you increase the sample size, you might find a trend, but. Like if you just looked at adults. So then based on the results of the, the age thing, you would know that you would want to need, you need to have older females and you could include younger males. But if you included that and just looked at the adults, potentially maybe you'd see females are coming out higher if you control for size. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, and then, yeah, it's always it's also those males that grow much larger than any female, so that might also skew the data. So if we were to take that out, maybe we might find a difference. Because you're also expecting females to be higher based on just like the ecological results on what they're that they're have a more specialized diet too, right? From the beginning. Right. It, well, it also really depends on what they're specializing. So mm -hmm. if they're okay. snail specialists, those those shells are like what, like 900 newtons to break, so they would probably need a high bite force, but then they're also using tools, so that might lower that breaking force. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the challenge. Yeah, it's so interesting. Yeah. Maybe its parents didn't teach it how to do it. Yeah, maybe. Well, so do, how sea otters specialize on a particular diet is that it's taught by their mother, and same thing as the tool use. 
behavior. So if the mom teaches the pup how to what prey to specialize on, that pup will grow up specializing on that particular prey. The same thing as the tool use. If it's being taught to use tools, it'll also use tools for its life. What proportion of sea otters are using tools, like in the area that you're looking at? Do you do they know? I don't know if they know the exact number, but it's it's definitely it's less than fifty percent. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks, Chris. That was awesome, and um, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, we'll have a speaker next month. Hope I think um, we'll be trying to grab somebody that'll talk about um, El Nino. Hopefully, that thing brings water. Um, so yeah, someone will get behind the climatology behind that. So that should be really interesting.